Hello and welcome back to the last video of chapter 10 about World War I, um, about Wilson, War and Peace, and the United States after World War I, uh, heading into the, our next chapter, the 1920s. Um, looking at our learning targets, we'll analyze how the U.S. military contributed to the Allied victory in the war. We'll describe the 14 points and what those are. Uh, we'll learn what those are. We will analyze decisions made during the Paris Peace Conference. We'll explain the controversy over the ratification of the treaty ending World War I, which America does not sign or ratify. And we'll describe the problems that America faced immediately after the war. And so when America enters the war after the release of the Zimmerman note and Wilson declares a, uh, asks Congress to declare war on Germany, we begin a convoy system. And this really protects um, ships that are sailing with goods and weapons. And our added <coughs> navy allowed them to do this. The merchant ships sail together and are protected by warships along the outside. So now German U-boats cannot sink any more ships. It seems like a very simple solution, but it really did turn the course of the war. In 1917, Vladimir Lenin actually starts a revolution in Russia for the communists, and Russia pulls out because they have to go fight their own civil war. And in um, um, uh, 1918 is when American troops started really arriving in France in uh, any large amounts, and they're called doughboys, and nobody really um, knows the origins of this. Some people say it dates back to the Mexican-American War. Some people say that it is from the Civil War and the dough-shaped pendants that uh, Union soldiers would wear. Some people say it's in negative terms um, that soldiers would call each other. But for um, now, after the war is over, they don't call them doughboys anymore, and they um, start to use the term GI um, as we go into World War II. Uh, the Germans begin running out of troops and supplies during this time. Uh, 1.5 million Americans fight and 50,000 die in this war. So our entry into the war really gives a boost to the Allies and destroys the Germans. And they begin running out of troops and supplies. And on November 11th, 1918, which is known as Armistice Day, and now it's known as Veterans Day, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, Germany f uh, finally surrendered, and total casualties, we have 5 million Allied troops dead, 8 million Central troops dead, and 6.5 million civilians dead from World War I. Wilson, in his uh, victory, wants to promote peace without victory. And the United States, since they turned the tide of the war, they are pretty much a world leader at this point. And Wilson wants to push peace without victory, meaning that there's no loser in the war, but we just have to be glad that it's over and we need to move on. And Wilson promotes his 14 points to Congress and wants to take them to the Paris Peace Conference with him. And the 14 points are Wilson's aims in the post-war world. And there's 14 of them, obviously, but I'm going to go through the more uh, major ones. Uh, freedom of the seas. So um, countries can't own different parts of the ocean, but there's international waters. Uh, free trade. No more carving up colonies and stuff. He wants to end colonialism and imperialism. Uh, he wants to reduce the number of arms in the world. And the number one, probably the second most important one, is he wants to push self-determination, which means that countries would be able to choose their own government and then instead of having government thrust upon them. And then his most, um, his, his best um, contribution to this is to begin a League of Nations, which is kind of like the first United Nations except it didn't have as much power. And even today, the United Nations doesn't have a lot of power. But the League of Nations is made to work out problems diplomatically and talking about it without actually going and starting a war. So Wilson is the first president to go overseas during his presidency, and he goes to France to attend the Paris Peace Conference. 
It is held by the Allies in Versailles, France, just outside of Paris, to write the Treaty of Versailles. And the two European leaders of the Entente powers are um, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George and French Premier G Georges Clemenceau. They do not share Wilson's idealism. They got they lost a lot during this war. They lost millions of troops, and they suffer greater losses than U the United States. Millions of Allied troops are dead, and that's only 50,000 U.S. troops compared to how many they lost. So they do not add all of Wilson's 14 points. They don't do freedom of the seas. They don't do self-determination, but they do begin a League of Nations. And their main goal in this is to make Germany suffer for starting the war. They want an admission of guilt, they want an apology, and they want Germany to pay reparations, which are payment for the damages of war. So Germany's going to go deep into debt, and they're going to um, have the economic depression that we're going to have about a decade early. And this is supposed to weaken them so they can never threaten Europe again, but making them the loser in this actually upsets them and they resent being uh, the loser in this war and being punished for it and so they will rise up again about 20 years later you know throughout those 20 years they rise up again and we will begin world war two so the new countries are not allowed self-determination Germany is split up, so we now, Germany is very small at this point, so now we have Germans living in non-German states, which is a problem in Europe back then. In the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire is broken up, and the, these new states that are created of Iraq, Syria, and Jordan, they combine ethnic groups randomly, which is never a good sign for um, uh, trying to keep the peace. These new states were overseen by Britain and France, and they're not granted self-determination, so there's a huge problem after this Treaty of Versailles. And then finally, America doesn't even ratify the treaty. They reject it. Treaties that America enters into needs to be ratified by the Senate. And there's two groups of people in the Senate. There's the irreconcilables, who are isolationist senators, who see that, feel that the United States should not be involved in world politics in any way. And then there's the reservationists who um, want some changes because they're afraid that the way it's worded, Europe, I if the United States enters this treaty, they would be dragged into future conflicts in Europe, and they don't want that. They want to remain isolationist. America does not ratify the Treaty of Versailles which means the United States does not join the League of Nations, even though it was our idea, we don't join. And so Wilson's idea is fulfilled, but it lacks the teeth because America does not join it. So now let's go ahead and talk about the effects of the war at home. Uh, there's an influenza pandemic and an epidemic versus a pandemic. A pandemic is worldwide, whereas epidemic is just one landmass. Uh, it kills millions worldwide. It's a bird flu that spreads to humans, that starts in the U.S. and spreads worldwide, but it was very deadly. They did not have the flu shot back then. Um, for minorities, it's back to reality from uh, pitching in in the home front. They, blacks have to compete for jobs and housing with returning soldiers, and of course they're going to give it to the returning soldiers who are coming back who fought for their country. And there are actually race riots during this time in Chicago and Tulsa, Oklahoma. Economic problems. The inflation during after the war causes problems. And usually after a war, there will be inflation um, as consumers buy, start to buy consumer goods and not war bonds. Or they don't start to um, pitch into the war effort and buy war bonds anymore. And then the red scare. After Russia's civil war, they become the Soviet Union, a communist nation with a communist government. And these people want to bring an end to capitalism everywhere, which frightens United States workers. And revolts start in Eastern Europe, and those will become part of the Soviet Union eventually, the countries in Eastern Europe. And that furthers the fear that U.S. workers had that communism is taking over worldwide. And so this begins the American Red Scare, the first one. There's a second one in the 1950s. 
but this is widespread fear against alleged communists. Um, bombs are starting to be exploded in cities like New York by anarchists, and people are just scared out of their wits about anybody who has a different view of themselves. And even, even more so, our Attorney General Mitchell Palmer rounds up a lot of these suspected radicals and communists and he casts a wide net and he even caught anarchists who haven't done anything wrong and simple immigrants from Central and Eastern Europe and they were innocent but still they were deported and after this the American Civil Liberties Union forms to protect the rights of these immigrants and the ACLU is still around today fighting for uh, the rights of Americans who feel they've been violated. And lastly, a part of the Red Scare, uh, the Sacco and Vanzetti trial, they are Italian anarchists who ch um, are charged for a murder, and they are only charged on racial evidence because a witness said that the people looked Italian, whatever that means. And so they arrest Sacco and Vanzetti, and they're put to death by electric chair, so we also have this fear of immigrants and people who are different, like anarchists. And America's role in the world has obviously changed after World War I, but we don't accept it right away. Warren G. Harding is elected president in 1920, and he calls for a return to normalcy, or basically the way things were. He's tired, people are tired of all this progressivism and being at war. And the United States ends up becoming an economic giant. We are the largest creditor nation in the world, which means the nations around the world owe the U.S. more money than the U.S. owes them. And after World War I, the economic center of the world shifts from London to New York City. And so the new world order takes hold after World War I. We've had two monarchies thrown, uh, overthrown in Germany and Russia. We've had Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman empires are dissolved. So now the United, States becomes, the United States becomes one of the new leaders. But can we afford to stay isolated any longer? We're going to try. We're going to go through a Great Depression. We're going to go through um, recovery from that Great Depression. And then we're going to enter World War II where we realize we can't afford to sit on the sidelines any longer. And that's all I have for you today. Hopefully it wasn't too painful. Um, go ahead and fill out those learning targets and be ready for your test. Uh, goodbye.